Good morning, church. I bring you news of the community before we begin worship for this morning. Beloved disciple, friend to many, and faithful servant of this congregation, Paul Caldwell, passed away this past Friday. We are grateful to God for Paul's service to this church community. There's pretty much nothing that Paul didn't do at this church, from Bible teacher to shared bread, dedicated volunteer to working in all aspects of finance to so much more. Paul was a dedicated member of this congregation and a faithful servant of Jesus Christ. This week, as I talked with the family, they spoke of how grateful they are to this church for the outpouring of cards and stories and love for Paul before his passing. It really meant so much to them to receive all of those cards from this community. The family is grieving, and I'm sure they will get to planning soon. And as soon as we know more, we will share that information with you. In the meantime, I invite your prayers for Paul's family, for all who loved Paul, as we thank God for Paul and for his legacy and for his eternal rest with his Savior Jesus. Good morning, church. It's Sunday, March 21st, and we're really glad that you're worshiping with us this morning. If you haven't already, I encourage you to go to beachfaith.com, click on the Watch Live button. You'll find all kinds of things there to help you with worship for today. There are two things I encourage you to have if you haven't already collected those things for worship. The first is the item for the ritual action for this week. The second thing, is what you see on the table behind me, which is, it is Communion Sunday, so I invite you to go get bread or a bread-like product and juice or a juice-like product and have those ready for worship this morning. We will utilize both of those things in a little bit. This is the last full Sunday of Lent. Next week we begin the Holy Week uh, together and start with Palm Sunday. We're gonna have a variety of different options to help those who uh, feel most comfortable to worship online or to have other options. So please keep an eye out for all of those details, including a Holy Week online worship kit, which will be coming home to those in the local area if you didn't pick it up yesterday. So keep an eye out for that. Today we uh, venture into another set of healing stories with Jesus and talk about the integration of healing, of body, mind, and spirit, and also how healing works in community. It's a great Sunday. It's a great way to end this series and season of recovery, remembering that healing is not compartmentalized, but it is a part of all of God's creation and a part of our community, as well as our individual lives. For Christ's guidance, his witness, and for his healing, we are grateful. Let us worship God together now. Good morning, everyone. We have seen that the stories of Jesus' healing ministry are filled with words and deeds. We know that his healing was not confined to that moment in history, but offers a new way of life that has made a case for compassion for all, especially the least, ever since. As we wind down our journey of Lent and head into the events of Holy Week, we begin to see that our ability to forgive ourselves and others is the foundation that can help transform infirmities and allow us to move on. We integrate our beliefs and actions for the health of the whole. We glorify God for beautiful words and works of wholeness and share that treasured beauty with others. We know there will still be pain, but we also know love will win. Let us worship our God of grace and glory now.
Let us pray. Healer of our every ill, especially when we find it difficult to believe or trust that sorrow will end, we come before you to make our petitions known. Hear our cries for healing of body, mind, and spirit. We know that already you are at work among us, showing us the way to recovery from the toxicities and grief of our time. Even when we cannot seem to believe it, we know that you see beauty in our brokenness. We especially pray for those who feel that there is no end to sorrow, that no matter what we do or how hard we work to bring peace and justice to our world, it seems like we cannot gain traction. We give thanks that when we cannot bring ourselves to the healing source of your love, there are others around us that, through words and actions, bring us hope once again. Help us to be those who offer hope when we have the opportunity on this journey of compassion called life. Remind us that discipleship is not about having it our way, but yours. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I thought that since a lot of us are starting to go back to school, that this would be a good time to revisit our back to school children's moment from September. I hope that you enjoy and I hope that you know that we wish the same grace and love for you going back to school in, in March as we do when you go back to school in September. And we are praying for students and teachers and parents during this time of adjustment too. Good morning. I am so glad to see you. I am in my office today and you may have been in here before, maybe not. I don't come in here every day like I used to, but I'm here today to do some work and I was thinking that a lot of you are probably getting back into your workspace too, even if that's at home. Have you started school yet? Did you start two weeks ago this week? I imagine that there's a lot that you're still figuring out and that you're still learning about. And I hope that you're being kind to yourself as you figure out these new things, whether you're a teacher or a student or a parent, I hope that you are being kind to yourself this week. We are so lucky to know God because knowing God means experiencing grace. Have you heard that word, grace? Grace is something that God gives us. It's a chance to start over. It's a chance to do something again if we need to. And it's a chance to do things that let other people make mistakes that can be forgiven too. Grace is not just something for us to be forgiven, but grace is a gift that God gives us that we can give others. It's a way that we can live and people will know that we are followers of Jesus and that we love God when we act with grace and kindness. The reason that I'm bringing up grace today is that you may need a lot of grace for yourself right now. You might need grace for your parents as they help figure things out for you. Maybe you need to have grace for your poor teachers who are having to figure out how to do everything online. Oh my goodness. And I hope that you're having grace for yourself when things don't go the way that you think that they should. 
I want to read you guys a book today, and I hope that it will help you remember how you can be kind to yourself with grace and be patient with yourself the way God is so patient with us, because we never get anything right the first time. We don't always get everything right right away, but grace is a way to live and love that lets us know and lets other people know that there's always a chance to do it better and to do it again and to have a fresh start the next day. So I'm going to read you a book. It's called Trying Again. It's by Emily Arrow, and the illustrations are by Kayla Stark. There's also a song about this. This is actually a song. I'm not going to sing it to you today, but if you want to look up the song, it's called Trying Again by Emily Arrow. Have you ever tried something that didn't work? Maybe you started making something, but it broke. Maybe you need to learn something new before you can finish. Or maybe you just made a mistake. Do you feel like giving up? Or did you try again and did you succeed? Whether you're growing a plant or learning to ride a skateboard, trying again is how we learn new things and challenge ourselves. Are you ready to try again? Let's turn the page and find out and read along. My very own plant is so much fun, but oh no, I gave it too much sun. Oh no, I gave it too much sun. And when I think I can't, I just add yet. I can't do it yet. It isn't working yet. It isn't growing yet but I'll still grow if I try again. I'll water my plant to help it grow, but oh no, it overflowed. Oh no, it overflowed. And when I think I can't, I just add yet. I can't do it yet. It isn't working yet. It isn't growing yet but I'll still grow if I try again. I can sing it a song or take it for a ride, but oh no, I broke it this time. Oh no, I broke it this time. Everybody hits a few bumps in the road, but don't quit then, try again, because that is when we really Grow and grow and grow and grow. So when I think I can't, I just add yet. I just can't do it yet. It isn't working yet. It isn't growing yet. But I'll still grow if I try again. I'll still grow if I try again. I'm going to try, try, try again. The end. I hope that you will give yourself a chance to try again when you need to this week. I hope that you will give others a chance to try again when they need to. We all need a little grace once in a while. God gives us grace for free no matter where we've been or what we're struggling with or what we need to grow into. And that is the best thing that happens to us in our life is grace. I wrote a special prayer for our students and our teachers and our parents, and I would love to share it with you now. And I would like to call this, we usually do a blessing of the backpacks. So if you wanna have your backpack blessed, you can get it out. If you just want to absorb God's love and grace as we share this prayer with you, teachers, students, parents, grandparents, supporters, this is for you. God of growth, transitions, and learning, we ask for blessings on internet connections and virtual classrooms. We pray for grace on both ends of the Zoom meeting. We thank you, Creator, for those who have all they need to learn and to teach at home. And we remember those who are often safer at school and who are really missing school lunches at home. God of the extrovert, bring moments of interaction that energize and carry folks through these moments. 
God of the introvert, grant quiet moments to restore our souls in crowded homes. Though we walk through unknown territory, we give thanks for the ways we can connect in these unusual times. We give thanks for educators selflessly giving, going above and beyond to teach learners of all ages. We give thanks for pets, the real MVPs of this hard year, and now our constant companions for the grace that they never stop offering us. We ask that you will calm anxious hearts, empower minds to be open and ready to learn. May teachers extend your grace to students and parents as you continue to equip them to teach with love in new ways in this new era. May students remember that they are invited to try again. We ask all of this in the grace and love of Creator, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Students, teachers, parents, support systems, we give thanks for you and we are praying for you today and always. I'm a teacher's kid. I'm a teacher's niece. I'm a teacher's cousin. Teachers matter. Learning matters. And we thank you for all that you are doing. Students, you're being brave. You're succeeding. And we are so proud of you. We love you very much. And we miss you so much. We'll talk to you real soon. Bye. and you
Today's scripture is from Matthew chapter 9, verses 1 through 8. And after getting into a boat, he crossed the sea and came to his own town. And just then, some people were carrying a paralyzed man lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Then some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, perceiving their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Stand up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, Stand up, take your bed, and go to your home. And he stood up and went to his home. When the crowd saw it, they were filled with awe, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to human beings. Let's pray. O oh God, you shelter your people amid their distress. You provide them a haven of security and rest. You bring comfort to those with affliction and hear the pleas of the persecuted. You offer forgiveness and peace. You cause your mercy to flow like living water. Your benevolence stretches to the ends of the earth. We come, O oh God, in praise for all your goodness and lift our voices with thanks for your care. Open our hearts and minds and spirits to receive what it is for us to take heart. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Over and over again throughout the season of Lent, we've encountered the healing stories of Jesus in chapters 8 and 9 of the Gospel of Matthew. And we've noticed some important things. For one, we've noticed that Jesus does not ever look away from the pain and suffering around him. He doesn't discount the hurt of others by quickly wishing them to get well quickly. He doesn't say that the pain and tragedy and suffering of another is someone else's responsibility. Whenever someone with an affliction or need, disease or lack comes to Jesus, he sees them. He sees their pain. He sees how their suffering separates them from the community. He sees the shame and anguish, the desperation of others. I find this to be a great source of comfort. The idea that Jesus sees our pain and suffering, that he sees our humanity in the struggle and tragedy and journey we have in body, mind, or spirit, means that we never suffer or struggle alone. Jesus sees us. 
We're known. Our humanity is known. Our need is known. This again provides such comfort and grace and hope to me. I hope it does for you too. I think about loved ones during the pandemic who've had to be hospitalized or even passed away without their loved ones around them. And I imagine Jesus seeing their pain, seeing their need, and being present with them in the doctors and nurses and others who create, courageously worked in dangerous and uncertain conditions to lovingly care for them. I think about how Jesus sees the pain of the AAPI community after the events in Georgia this week. I think about how Jesus sees our pain and isolation, anxiety, grief, and so much more. Jesus sees our pain every time. What do we do when we see the pain of others? Do we look away, diminish it because it makes us feel awkward and insecure, or dismiss it because we don't relate to it? Or do we sit with it, acknowledge that it is real and painful? Seeing the pain of another allows them to know that they do not suffer alone. And maybe when we in turn are suffering, we won't be alone either. Jesus not only sees our pain, he responds compassionately. In the story for today, Jesus' words soothe the paralyzed man. Do you remember what Jesus called him? He called him son, an intimate, loving way to speak to him. It's more than calling him buddy or pal. By using this term, Jesus includes him in his family as a part of God's family. And then Jesus forgives his sins. We go to Jesus to forgive our sins weekly. We do this through confession and the gift of absolution. But in Jesus' time, this was a radical idea. The idea that Jesus could wipe away anything the scribes and others might use to stigmatize, dehumanize, or alienate the paralyzed man from the community was foreign. That's what God does, not humanity. While it is true that only God can forgive sins, Jesus does encourage us to think about the words we use when in situations where we're called to be present and encouraging to those who are suffering. I remember a time when I was grieving and a well-meaning church member came up to me and told me that it was time that I should just get over it and that these kinds of things build character. I've got plenty of character, I thought, and I felt alone in my grief and my pain. That wasn't what I needed, nor was it helpful, and I didn't find it kind either. The words we use or don't use make a difference. It's good to check in with yourself before saying something to make sure it's helpful, not harmful, kind, not dismissive. We've looked at how Jesus responded to the man by seeing him actively healing his body and spirit and doing so in a compassionate way. It is a great model for us in how we can holistically respond to the suffering and ailment of others. These healing stories also bear witness to the ways that communities of humans behave in the face of Jesus' miraculous agency. When Jesus responds with compassion, offering support and comfort and community, what we see in the story is a clear picture, thanks to the scribes, of what not to do. The scribes sit and watch this healing happen in silent judgment. Let that, that sink in for a minute. They watch it happen in silent judgment. I think we all know what it's like to be in that posture of silent judgment, don't we? The scribes elevated their own judgment and opinion above the work of God in their presence. They think it is their job to judge human actions and decide what is worthy, what is okay, and who is worthy and okay to receive God's blessing and God's transformation. This is a story of exclusion and inclusion where those in power think they're entitled entitled to judge and exclude those who don't fit into their boxes, categories, ideas, opinions, and tastes. As one scholar wrote, if sin is the thwarting of life, the fragmentation of community, 
the cre creation and deepening of division, then the passage casts the scribes as symbolic agents of sin. The author continues, authentic freedom challenges the scribes' constructs and unmasks the fear that gives rise to their negative judgments, which have real power to undermine community and diminish the flourishing of individuals. Jesus subverts such negative power, having performed the invisible miracle of forgiving the paralytic sin, he now performs the visible miracle of healing that which is but an outer sign. This insight is important and one that invites us to do some personal reflection. It invites us to reflect upon times where we've been symbolic agents of sin, silently judging another and deciding whether they are worthy of inclusion, healing, a second chance, forgiveness, mercy, and so on. When we find ourselves in the scribe's shoes deciding whether someone is deserving of God's love and grace and inclusion, debating the worthiness of another human being to be loved, healed, redeemed, included, we need, if we are in those positions, to get on our knees and ask for forgiveness. This is a humbling moment, to say the least. Jesus was pretty clear with the scribes with, about what he thought of their silent judgment. He let them know that he saw them too, and he called them out. Do you remember what he said? He called them out by saying, why do you have evil in your hearts? Those are some fighting words, aren't they? Now, that might have been, at first listen, listen, felt like some hyperbole, but for Jesus, it cut right to the heart of things, pun intended. Those with power and privilege and authority have an obligation to use their power for good. Jesus invites the scribes and each of us to ask ourselves, why do we harbor thoughts that cast shadow and doubt upon agents of God's love and grace in the world? And why do we allow and in some cases help systems that burden, restrict, and paralyze the children of God? If you sit back waiting for someone to fail or expect incompetence or look for signs of failure, that's what Jesus speaks to. If you discount the suffering of another or a group of people as not your problem, then you're casting a big shadow of doubt. If you think that others who are different are someone else's problem, that's shadow and doubt. Jesus then puts the scribes in a tough spot, asking them an impossible question. The scribes know that only God could forgive sin. In order to make it clear to them that Jesus was in fact God's son doing God's work in the world, he offered outward healing to make his point. Sometimes Jesus understood we need to see it to believe it. Jesus made it clear to the scribes and to us that we have agency to change our ways, our thoughts. We can open our minds and spirits and hearts to what is possible with God rather than limiting what God can do from the start. This story is not just about putting the scribes on notice and in their place, though that's pretty important and involves some strong words. It is also about the power of community in the healing process. It is the community that, is, that lifted and carried the paralyzed man into Jesus' presence. It is their hope and trust in Jesus as God's agent of healing and hope that they bring him forward. It is their trust in Jesus that allows for this man to not only be healed of his physical paralysis, but also to be healed in spirit as well. The crowd's collective work, their faith, their sweat equity, their determination to care for this man is rewarded, isn't it? Did you catch what Matthew said was the crowd's reaction to the man getting up and walking away? Matthew said the crowds respond in awe and by glorifying God. There's a comedian I appreciate who years ago talked about how we've watered down the word awesome. I know I'm guilty of it. 
She says, we've used it so much and on things that don't deserve being called awesome, like for instance, a hot dog, that the word lost its meaning and power. We might say the same thing about stories of healing in our lives and in the lives of other, others. We kind of expect that when we go to the doctor and tell them what's the matter, that they will heal us. Or when someone goes into remission, that we feel like it's a little bit miraculous, but we also kind of expect it because science is getting so good and they're able to do so much more now. We've lost our sense of awe at the power and the source of healing in our lives in so many ways. What might it take for us to recover that sense of awe and wonder when we see or experience healing? Many are so relieved, for example, to get the COVID vaccine that we miss how completely and amazing and almost unbelievable it is that scientists within less than a year's time were able to develop at least four vaccines safe and effective for worldwide use. That is awesome. And as variants of COVID emerge, those vaccines seem to fight against those variants. That is something that inspires awe in me. How about you? What practices or care can we do or offer that might inspire awe in our midst? The reaction of the crowd is to glorify God for what God has done in Jesus. They give credit where credit is due. The judgmental scribes didn't heal the man, nor did they forgive his sins. Jesus did. They see the one who's been given God's authority over created order and who can bring about new life and hope. How often do we not give credit where credit is due? The healing stories remind us that nothing, not even death, keeps us from God's love. That we are called to a life of faith and action. God is with us. God sees our pain and suffering. God hears our cries. We are not alone. God invites us through Jesus to be agents of healing mercy and grace. And as a community, we are invited to participate in the larger work of healing, recovery, restoration, and hope. How will you witness to the awe and wonder of what God is doing and done for us? The words of Jesus we heard in this week's healing story were many, but let us hone in on two words, take heart. The French word for heart, which I'm not great at pronouncing, but is coer, uh, and is a reference to the physical heart organ. It is also a word that means courage. Courage in the face of difficulty and care in the face of being disheartened. These go hand in hand. Even when we are disheartened, there are spiritual gifts within, healing and restoring us to hope and life. Healing is not always an absence of illness, but rather a trust that God is holding our brokenness and that we can move on in life with assurance, making beauty in the midst of hard times. Sometimes courage invites us to see the gifts and blessings within. Today I invite you to find this cross, and the words attached. While we might suffer, struggle, feel insecure and uncertain, there are gifts within. 
gifts God gives us that remind us that we are never separated from the love of God in Christ and help us to see these gifts within others. I invite you to remove and stick those words that you see as a part of your resilience and spirit and add them to the cross. I am ready, capable, worthy, hopeful. If there are other words that aren't printed out for you that you know reflect your spirit now, we've given you a couple of stickers on a small slip of paper to write those words on and to add them to the cross. As we move towards Holy Week and what Jesus does for us on the cross, keep this nearby so that you can see how his sacrifice and resurrection help us to be whole, holy, and holy. Amen. Church, as we prepare to receive our tithes and offerings to God's glory and to the work that Christ calls us to do as this beloved community, I remind you there are three ways to share your tithes and offerings. The first is to mail your gift or offering into the church or drop it in the church mail slot. The second is to go to beachfaith.com, click on the donate button and find two secure ways to give online there or you can go to the text to give option which is on the screen type in that number plus the word beach faith and the dollar amount it will send you a link to complete your gift we are grateful to god for your continued generosity during these times and we are grateful to god for the the blessings we have and the blessings we share will you join me in this offering of prayer God of compassion, when we failed to keep your commandments and rebelled against that which would bring peace and joy to our lives, your love was so great that you offered us a new covenant, one not written on tablets, but on our hearts. In our giving and in all our offerings, may it be our lives, our love and dedication that we bring to your altar. May we remember in our giving that you loved us so much that the sacrifice of your son on the cross for us was not too great a cost. Our gifts are meager in comparison, but allow them to remind us of what you gave first. In Christ, our Savior and Redeemer, we pray. Amen. Will we 
ever rise Will we ever rise above the fear Can we learn to see the need Can we share humanity I can see We have approached confession each week in Lent in such a way that we lay bare the brokenness in order to begin the process of healing. Along the way, we have acknowledged our need to restore our own holy vessels while attending to our role in the healing of community and the world. The work of healing will continue as we integrate all that we have learned with all that we will do moving forward. For now, we remember how hard it is to move from thinking to doing. Let us pray. Forgiving God, we have opened ourselves to healing, and sometimes it is easier to pray nice prayers than to do the hard work of putting into action what needs to happen. Help us remember the sacred nature of the holy vessels that we are fragile and susceptible to shattering, and yet capable of transformation. Help us to see ourselves as you see us. Help us to believe in our ability to change and heal as you believe in us. Help us heal. Show us our strength. Forgive our inertia. Move us to move one step at a time toward greater care. 
In this silence, we sense and acknowledge our yearning for wholeness. Some struggle or have struggled in this season of recovery to feel this warmth of assurance within you. If this is true for you, do not despair. You are not the one who has to create the light. It just is. And it is a pilot light that never goes out. You will at some time begin to notice it returning to your awareness. Know this. You are never alone in the struggle, no matter what. Jesus is on the journey with us. Life's journey is not passing you by, even though it might feel that way during this time of physical and social isolation. You are a part of this body of Christ, a community seeking healing. For you, for me, for all. Take a deep breath in to let this truth fill you. And breathe out with the relief of assurance. Church, having confessed and received Christ's forgiveness, let us share signs and words of Christ's peace with one another. Write words of peace in the comments below. Text, call, or share peace with those in your household if you are with others. May the peace of Christ be with you. Church, as we gather here today in the sight of God to join in Holy Communion, we know we are only a screen width apart. The God of all creation is not beholden to the bounds of time or place. God transcends our physical distances and parts the veil between us so that we may be together in this mystical space. Through God and the mystery of Holy Communion, we become one creation, one body, one church. The Lord be with you. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you. In the beginning, you breathed life into raw materials, creating and animating containers of beauty and goodness. We, your holy vessels, were fired in the kiln of love until we shined with your light. Susceptible to shattering, we find ourselves broken unable at times to remember your promise of repair. You remind us time and again that though broken, we are held in your presence and made whole by your grace. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Holy vessel of divine presence on earth. Your spirit anointed him as a container of grace in the form of preaching good news to the poor, proclaiming release to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, and setting at liberty those who are oppressed and announcing that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with those considered too broken for company. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to the path of healing and recovery, delivered us from our despair and isolation, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always. In the power of your word and Holy Spirit, we are not alone. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, 
take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of the healing, life-transforming acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered in this holy space and on the, the gift of these elements. Make them be for us your healing spirit through Christ, so that we may be for the world the body of Christ, healing agents in a broken world, offering the lifeblood of hope. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, healing God, now and forever. Amen. And now let us pray together the prayer Jesus taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Join us as we partake in the body of Christ in remembrance of him. I want to invite each person to take a piece of bread or similar item. Hold it in your hand. The body of Christ given for you. Join us as we share in this blessing of the cup of the new covenant, the cup of blessing poured out for you and for all. I want you to find your cup of juice or similar item. This fruit of the vine is made by many hands from many places, yet flows freely. This is the cup of salvation for you. And now let us eat and share this meal together.
Church, as we prepare to go about our day and our week, hear these words of blessing. Now go with confidence that God is making us whole and holy, recovering our depth of love for all and our joy of living in this world. May the words of Jesus ring in your ears, take heart. And may the Spirit hover, move, and deliver salve to your soul and a spring in your step. Amen.